Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm really excited that we have Akshay Agarwal here to talk about Marimo uh, as our invited speaker for the Pangeo yeah. Showcase. Um, Akshay has done some really cool work in the open source ecosystem. He's contributed to TensorFlow, developed uh, PyMDE, a PyTorch library for custom embeddings. Uh, I was also really impressed to see that all of his PhD research at Stanford was accompanied by open source software. Um, and that he's written a book on embedding. So uh, it's really fantastic to have you here today, Akshay, and I'll leave it to you to um, give your talk. Cool. Uh, thanks, Max. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for having me. Uh, let me share my screen. Just gonna share the whole thing. One second. Cool. All right, sharing. Can you all see my screen? Looks great. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, my latest open source project, which I've been working on for the past two years now, two years and change. Well, it's, it's been a bit, but I work in it full time with one other developer named Miles Skolnick. Um, and this project is called Marimo. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, open source reactive Python notebook. Um, there we go. Uh, Marimo is an open source reactive Python notebook uh, that stands as an alternative to, to Jupyter notebooks uh, that's shareable as a web app. So similar to Streamlit, if you guys have tried that, uh, but it's also executable as a pure Python script. And that's because uh, the files are stored as pure Python. Um, and as a corollary to that, it's versionable with uh, Git. Um, and so Marimo came out of uh, using, you know, my own experience using Jupyter basically every day during my PhD at Stanford and sort of accumulating some, you know, frustrations with uh, it as a, a sort of a, a software tool for, for doing reproducible research um, and, and other data related work. And it also came from inspiration from the, the greater ecosystem of, of notebooks. Um, in particular, I saw Pluto JL for Julia and Observable uh, for JavaScript, to, two big inspirations. If you guys have seen it, seen either of those. Um, so to set set the stage, I do think notebooks are really cool because uh, they let you mix Markdown code and visuals in an interactive programming environment, <laughs> and you can hold your data in RAM while you work uh, with it, which is I think sort of unique uh, compared to scripts. Um, and I'm not the only one who thinks this. There's apparently over 10 million Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. So it's a, it's a lot of notebooks. Um, at the same time, while I think they're awesome, it, I've seen opinions like this on my Twitter feed uh, on a regular basis. Um, mine might be biased because I'm, I'm working on an alternative to traditional notebooks. Um, but but the, I think notebooks sort of evoke a strong response from people, especially people who work uh, I don't know, cl closer to software engineering. And um, I think one of the main complaints that people have about Jupyter Notebooks, among others, but one of them, um, or at least traditional notebooks, is this idea of hidden state. So what I mean by hidden state, and others have commented on this, is that you, you can get your notebook into strange situations where like the code on the page doesn't match the outputs you see. And, uh, so in this case, we have two cells, x equals one, and then another cell showing the output of x. It looks like both cells have been executed and yet X is zero for some strange reason. This, this notebook is even weirder because X is not defined anywhere. And yet, you know, I can run the cell and I can see that apparently the value of X is zero. Um, and sort of this hidden state problem leads to like issues and like reproducibility of research where like, you know, you'll run a notebook, get some results. You may have run cells out of order. You may have deleted one cell and forgot to run some other cells. And then when you run it from scratch the next time, you just get totally different results. And so the same study that found that there were 10 million notebooks on GitHub, Jupyter notebooks on GitHub, this was a JetBrain study, found that like over a third of them uh, weren't reproducible in the sense that they were running some strange out of nonlinear order. Um, so that, that's sort of a big problem for, for, for science. Um, so a couple of years ago, I sort of you know, set out to, uh, try and build, you know, an alternative to this traditional way of working with notebooks. And I, I had a few criteria, one of which was 
reproducibility in, in a specific sense that the code on the page should match the outputs you see. Another one was maintainability, like like any other software. So um, in Jupyter notebooks are traditionally stored as these big JSON files. And if you make a change to, to a notebook, you just get a horrendously large git diff and you have to work around that. And then finally, I think sort of the payoff of these two things criteria is like productionizability and in a specific sense that um, the Marima notebook is deployable as a web app. Any notebook can be deployed as a web app with interactive UI elements, streamlet style. Uh, and then also uh, executable as a Python script uh, with command line arguments that you can um, uh, parameterize them with. Uh, so I think like probably at this point, the best thing for me to do is just show you uh, what, what we've built in the past couple of years. Um, and so let me, let me create a notebook. Uh, so like Jupyter, <laughs> excuse me, you can create a notebook uh, from the command line. Uh, and in this case, the command line uh, tool is called Marimo. So I'm going to type Marimo, <laughs> excuse me, Marimo, edit, uh, my notebook.py. So the first thing you'll notice that this notebook has a PY extension, and that's because in Marimo, notebooks are stored as Python files. This opens a uh, tab in my browser. That looks sort of like you might expect a Jupyter notebook to look like or any other notebook. I, I've got a cell here and I can type Python code in this cell. So I'm gonna start with a basic demo that just illustrates the idea and then we'll sort of make it more interesting. So I've declared a variable X here and in this next cell, I'm gonna output the value of X. Um, so the biggest difference between Marimo and, uh, and a Jupyter notebook is that Marimo parses uh, your notebook cells almost like Excel does. So it knows the dependencies uh, between uh, across all cells. So specifically, if this cell declares a variable X, this cell reads the value of X. If I run the first cell changing its value of one, if you look at the output of X in the second cell, you'll see that when I ran that cell, it automatically updated to two. And that's because Marima knows that this cell reads the value of X, second cell reads the value of X, the first cell declares the variable X. And so these two things are related. So in this sense, Marimo keeps your code and outputs consistent. And we do have an option to disable the automatic execution while still giving you guarantees on the state of your notebook um, in case your notebook is like super expensive or something. Um, a second way that Marimo differs from traditional notebooks is that it comes with a library of UI elements built in and you can access those by importing Marimo itself into the notebook as a library. So for example, I can import Marimo as Mo, replace X here with an integer slider from one to 10, I can give it a label too if I like. I'll output it here. And then in this third cell, I'm gonna replace X with its value. So I'm gonna, X is now a slider object. I'm gonna output X dot value. Um, if I do this, and then hit this button in the bottom right to run all stale cells. You'll see here now I've got a slider here, I have its value here, and as I scrub the slider, the value of X is updating automatically. And again, the way that this is working is that Marimo knows that, hey, this third cell now uh, depends on the variable X. The first cell declares the variable X. So if I interact with any UI, if this interact with the UI element X, I have to run all other cells that reference X. Uh, so in this way, this is what we mean that by Marimo is reactive. Um, it reacts to your UI interactions and your execution of code. So this is a silly example, uh, but hopefully it gets the point across. Uh, sort of more interesting, and maybe for, for this talk, is that like we have a... Copy this code here. Um, we, we have a whole bunch of different UI elements, um, and, and some of them enable new kinds of, I think, workflows for working with data that's just not really possible or e easily done in Jupyter Notebooks. So for example, here I have output a plotly uh, plot. Uh, this, this is normal, but it's a scatter plot overlaid on, um, uh, uh, on a map uh, of a location in Canada, I believe. So uh, th this is normal. But what I can do is actually, I can take my plotly plot and convert it into a, a Marimo UI element. So, and I can do that in just one line. I'm going to replace, I'm going to wrap the plot in mo.ui.plotly. 
And what this does is this, this turns this functionally into something like that slider where I showed you where um, now I'm gonna hide this code here, create one more cell. This plot, the variable is called fig. I can now type fig.value in the next cell. And if I make selections on this plot, the selection values are automatically sent back to Python. And so you can build some like really cool interactive exploratory tools using this basic value, uh, th this basic functionality. As you'll notice, there's like no callbacks required, no uh, extra code you need to write um, in order to get this synchronization behavior um, uh, working. And then finally, uh, I guess the last thing I can show you is that um, you can also write markdown. Uh, you can use a markdown cell or you can actually dynamically write markdown Oops. that depends on the values of other uh, variables um, using Python F strings. So for example, I can say the data you selected is um, uh, take that value and I'll convert this just to HTML. Delete this, this here. Uh, and then I, the last thing I'll do here, you can hide all the code and see what we're working with. Um, and yeah, so now I can make these selections. You'll see uh, the the markdown and the and, and the selected value is updating automatically down here. Um, cool. That that's a world world tool uh, uh, tour of the functionality that that Marimo provides um, in terms of reactivity and UI elements. Um, if I close this, we can take a look at the, the code for the demo that I just made. And you'll see it's actually really just Python. The code of each cell is just wrapped in a little bit of boilerplate, these functions that are decorated at that cell. Uh, but the important part is that at the end of here, there's an if name equals main block at dot run. And what this will do is just, it'll just run your notebook from top to bottom. Um, and so if your notebook had any side effects, if it printed anything to console, you would see that all appear. Uh, and so basically now every one of your notebooks can be reused uh, as a script. Um, you can make uh, a, a whole bunch of sort of really interesting uh, applications basically using uh, this functionality. So like if, if you guys are familiar with Streamlit, Marimo can do essentially all that Streamlit can do with the benefit that because we make a fine-grained graph over your cells, um, when you run an interaction with a UI element in Marimo, Marimo runs the minimal amount of cells required in order to keep your notebook up to date. So if you use Streamlit, Streamlit will rerun your entire script from top to bottom when you scrub a slider, which can become a huge headache. And in Marimo, you scrub a, sli scrub a slider, only the cells that use the value of the slider um, will run automatically. Uh, so I do have more slides, um, but I also want to be mindful of time. So I'm happy to, if there are questions, I know it was supposed to be 10 to 15 minute talk, so I'm happy to sort of answer questions. Uh, if there are questions, I feel like they may probably touch on the, the slide material I have later on. Um, Max, curious to hear what you think is best. Um, usually we turn off the recording for the question portion. So um, I think we could open it for some clarifying questions, but for discussion-based questions, it'd probably be better to just keep with doing the talk. Um, we're okay. doing okay with time. Uh, people often <laughs> go over the, <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes, so you're welcome. Okay, cool. Um, if there are any clarifying questions right now, feel free to interrupt me um, or, or ask them right now. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Okay, I, I'm gonna keep going for now. Um, so three tenants of Marimo, right? I mentioned reproducibility. Um, the second one was maintainability, the pure Python format. Um, and the third one was uh, productionizability or reusability with apps and scripts. So for reproducibility, it really comes down to reactive execution, like I showed you. And, and the idea is that um, in traditional notebooks, there's a mutable workspace and cells can run in an arbitrary order and that accumulates hidden, hidden state. And so the goal of Marimo with having this reactive execution is to eliminate that factor of execution history mad, uh, um, uh, it, eliminate execution history as a variable in the notebook state. So basically, whatever your code on the pages should uniquely determine the variables and not the order in which you just went around running cells. Um, and so 
<laughs> one analogy, if it hasn't become clear already, is Excel. I like to say this is like the original reactive notebook, right? You've got a bunch of cells with data or formulas in it, and you change some data and things that depend on it are automatically recalculated. And this is like a really, I think, intuitive concept that we've gotten really familiar with. Um, and uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to bring to notebooks. Otherwise, the cognitive burden of sort of remembering what to run manually can uh, can become kind of uh, difficult to deal with. And so, yeah, like, like you guys saw, Marimo recalculates like a spreadsheet. Um, oh, I didn't show this, but this is kind of interesting. So if you delete a variable in Marimo, uh, it will be automatically, it'll automatically remove that variable from the kernel's memory and invalidate the cells that depend upon it. And so this fixes like a huge class of bugs that people run into um, when working with Jupyter notebooks is that you delete some state, maybe even accidentally. And then the rest of the notebook depends upon it. And then the next time you run your notebook, it's broken. You no longer have the code to really know why. So this basically will catch that error for you immediately at the time it's made. Um, I showed that you can interpolate um, Python values into Markdown and pair that with reactivity to make cool little applets. Um, and this is sort of a, a fancier version of the, the map box, or the mapping demo I was showing you here where I have uh, uh, another scatter plot. This time it's an embedding of the MNIST data set. Uh, and I've wrapped it in a Marima UI element to make it reactive so that the selections of the digits that I'm selecting here are automatically set down to Python. And then I'm showing you a, a sort of a live preview. Um, and this was actually motivated by this example was motivated by my PhD thesis where I worked on uh, embedding models and 2D embeddings like this. And like I would produce these embeddings and then I would have no idea what was in the clusters because it was just a pain to like inspect them. And so this just like makes it super easy. And it's sort of something that I wished I had while I was working on this project. Um, so behind the scenes, how this works is that uh, Marima builds a directed acyclic graph on notebook cells. And it does this using static analysis, meaning we read your code, we don't run it. Uh, uh, so we, there's no overhead really, uh, um, there's no extra overhead uh, that Marima adds. And so we mark each cell with its variable definitions and references. And we do, uh, with that, we can for form this data flow graph. Uh, to, to make it deterministic, we have to in introduce some constraints. Like you ca actually can't uh, reassign variables in Marimo across cells, but we have ways to work around that. Um, we ban cycles, because I mean, that, that wouldn't make any sense in a recalculating spreadsheet uh, in a notebook. And then we also discourage variable mutations across cells. Um, and I think like one thing when I, when I set out to, to make Marimo, I, I wasn't sure how people would react to this constraints because it's different than working in a Jupyter notebook. But I think come to realize that like uh, every, everyone's worked with Excel and like you're, the people are used to reactive programming. Uh, so people, I, in my experience, have sort of been able to adapt rather quickly. Um, mentioned this in the beginning, these are two of Marimo's biggest inspirations and they're amazing projects. If you use the Julia programming language or JavaScript, I really encourage you to check them out. Uh, Pluto is the Julia, basically a Julia analog for Marimo and Observable is uh, the JavaScript analog. Um, I'll fly through this. I, I showed you the preview of the Python file format. The main thing to take away, I think at least for me is that it's designed so that small change to your notebook yields a small git diff or small diff. Uh, so you can just like work with it in the same way in, in a git repo. Um, because we're reproducible and maintainable, Marimo is like naturally in some sense productionizable. You can execute as a script, as I showed you. You can run it as an app. Um, I didn't show this from the command line, but if it, 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 it is a command line, uh, uh, to, you can use the command line tool to run uh, any notebook as an app. You just type marimo run notebook.py and it starts a read-only web server that serves your notebook as a little application. Um, so in this way, like you don't have to maintain a separate Jupyter notebook and like a streamlit application file in the same directory, you just use marimo sort of for, for both use cases. Um, that's the command. This is an example of running a marimo notebook as a script from the command line. Um, can skip this slide. Oh, and then one thing that's kind of cool is that we actually have made it possible for Marima to work entirely in the browser. So no backend required. And this is 
made possible with WebAssembly and PyDide. So we have this little online playground that you can try. It's at marimo.app and you can create like little permalinks and share them out to folks. Um, so it's great for just like creating little uh, demo notebooks or actually embedding them in your documentation. So we use this in our own Marimo docs to have live notebooks that cost us zero dollars to uh, to serve to to our users. Cool. Um, there's a bunch of links. I think the most important one is the GitHub link. So Marimo is all free and open source, Apache 2.0, um, Marimo team slash Marimo. Uh, and so you can, there's instructions here how to get install, started, just a pip install away. And then Marimo comes with a bunch of tutorials. You can start Marimo tutorial intro uh, in order to open the, the first one in the sequence. And I feel like I went over, but that's all I have. So thanks for listening.